Populism was once a provocative politics of the people, but author and historian Thomas Frank, he writes in his new book, The People Know, a brief history of anti-populism, that the new left turned politics into a path for personal fulfillment as to action for the common good. And Thomas joins us now to talk all about the book, which is a history both of populism and anti-populism. It is so great to have you, really an honor. It's my pleasure. Uh, absolutely. It's great to be here. Good to see you, sir. Um, so this word populist, uh, we talk about it a lot here on this show. It gets thrown a lot, around a lot in modern discourse, often in a very negative way. So could you just start by explaining where the term actually came from and what it actually means? You know, it's one of the the, the really interesting, there's so, there's not just does it get thrown around a lot, there's actually a, you know, a pedagogy out there. They call it global populism studies. These people who talk about nothing else but populism, but they weirdly have very little curiosity about where the word came from. And so I went and did the research and uh, I was very gratified to find that the word was invented at a spot very close to where I grew up uh, on a train between Kansas City and Topeka, Kansas in the year 1891. And it was invented deliberately to describe supporters of a uh, radical left-wing movement of that time that that came to be known as the Populist Party. It was a the last sort of great third party effort in this country. Right, and, and Thomas, as I understand it, your book, I mean, it's obviously, it's in the title, The History of Anti-Populism. We're kind of living probably in the most anti-populist moment in a long time. How did we get here? What, what's <laughs> yeah, happening? I know, it, it is fascinating, isn't it? Because yeah. you think that on the one hand, the situation, um, since I turned the book in, the situation has become so completely ripe for a kind of populist movement of our own time, by which I mean a transracial movement of working people demanding economic democracy. I mean, look at this pandemic that we're in, the massive spiking unemployment. It seems like a really good time for something like universal health care. But instead you have this, uh, you know, everywhere you turn, the word populism is used as a kind of a negative thing, as something that you need to avoid and be suspicious of and stay away from. We use it as shorthand now for uh, racist authoritarian demagogues, <laughs> and, uh, you know, which is completely 180 degrees the reverse of the original meaning. So what I tried to do in this book is, is ask how the word got flipped like that. How did that happen? Who did that? And how in the world did this sort of misappropriation of the word, how did that catch on in the way that it has? Mm. And so what did you find? Trey, tell us a little yeah. bit of the ah, history. <laughs> yes. Well, for the, the first half of the book, I sort of traced the, the, the good side of populism, the noble history of it in the 1890s and then in the 1930s, which is kind of the peak populist decade with Franklin Roosevelt and the labor movement and that's that sort of thing. But all along, there were people who despised populism and who regarded uh, these, uh, these sort of movements of the left as uh, you know, uh, uh, the riffraff trying to uh, tell their betters what to do using the, the democratic system, you know, using the democratic system inappropriately. And then in the after World War II, in the 1950s and 1960s, you had a new generation of intellectuals who uh, looked back at populism and decided, no, this wasn't this, you know, the, the movement in the 1890s now. They looked back at that and said, no, it wasn't this wonderful progressive thing that it seemed to be. In fact, it was a kind of proto-fascism. And uh, they were wrong. <laughs> they were completely mistaken uh, in factual historical terms. But their redefinition of populism uh, caught the public mind and uh, was became extremely popular. And that's sort of the origins of the way the word is used today. Um, I can tell you about why it caught on if you want to know. Oh, yes, please. Go ahead. Because this was th this, their redefinition of the term coincided with the kind of takeover of American life by the managerial class. I'm talking about the mm -hmm. 1950s here, the organization man, you know, that kind of thing. And at the time, MBAs were taking over American uh, business and uh, PhDs were running the great departments in Washington, Robert McNamara at the Pentagon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the, when they redefined populism, it was meant as a kind of manifesto for this new cohort that was coming up, the managerial elite. And they looked at populism and at working class reform movements and said, no, that's not how you do it. Okay, you don't, you don't achieve progress by putting together a movement of millions and millions of, of, of ordinary people because there's something wrong with ordinary people. They haven't been to graduate school. They're, they're the, they're, uh, their minds are subject to all sorts of pathologies and psychological uh, infirmities. You, you know the story. Of course. But we, 
we, the managerial elite, we understand things. We know how things work. We are we are supremely rational, you know. And so it was th their redefinition of populism became a kind of like. Um, Part of the definition of who they were, what they were displacing, this past that we had to put behind us forever. And basically, that's still how the word is used today. It's right. always as a, a rationalization for the managerial elite. Right. And, you know, Thomas, I mean, either a Trump second term or a Biden term, they're both, you know, let's just say not going to be the triumph of, you know, populist movements here in America. Uh, we've long kind of predicted, look, the dam has to break. It's like what you, you were saying. And we are living in a time which could probably is more rife for a populist uprising. And yet that's not necessarily what we're going to get. What does it look like historically if it's repressed or held off then for so long? And how does that going to play out in our society? <sighs> Look, I've been, I'm, I'm like you guys, only a little bit older, right? I've been yeah. expecting something, uh, some kind of populist movement since the 1980s. I, <laughs> you know, I went, I went into uh, journalism in, in the, in the 1980s and early 1990s, and I've been expecting it ever since then. And, uh, and, you know, the endless frustration, what happens while well, you're the, you know, your economic democracy, this, this country is a great middle-class democracy slowly gets eroded. Unfortunately, I'm really sorry to tell you guys that's already happened. And, you know, the, the, the country that I was born into, which was largely a product of these great populist movements of the past, civil rights movement, the uh, organized labor in the 1930s, the farmers movement, uh, that country that I was born into is, has largely um, uh, been destroyed. And that process is going to continue and the frustration is going to mount. And uh, I, my own feeling is that Trump will not be reelected because he's been a, you know, a colossal screw up. But that, the, that, that you're just going to get another Trump down the road who's not quite such a fool. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's going to continue and continue. And by the way, uh, you guys know this. I've been writing about the, uh, the, the, the the failures and mistakes of the Democratic Party for quite some time. They're not interested in reevaluating those mistakes in the direction that they've been on. And so I don't see either side uh, changing. Right. Reevaluating. Right. Quite the opposite. And and one of the tragedies that you really lay out so effectively here, and I finished the book last night, and I really highly recommend it to everyone, as I would highly recommend all of your books, frankly, but is the way that the, the Democratic Party has openly embraced this anti-populist rhetoric. I mean, explicitly. Um, you know, there's the whole conversation about you're not even allowed to grant that maybe some people who voted for Trump may have had legitimate <laughs> economic reasons in their life that they thought it was worth taking a chance on this guy, you know, colossal failure as he's ended up being. Yeah. You're not allowed to grant that. There's the whole conversation about deplorables, about who deserves respect and dignity and empathy in the country and who doesn't. And ultimately, you know, this sort of Pete Buttigieg uh, direction of the party is ascendant with the yeah. the governing elites and the marriage the you know the meritocracy and that that is in fact the rightful way that we should view and run the country yes you know, you're that's exactly a, right yes. that's a flip of what democrats you know claim to be they claim to be the party of the people how did that happen and what does that mean and and yet they have embraced and this is this is the uncanny thing that i discovered while i was doing the research for the book that i did in no way expected to find and com came as a complete surprise to me is that the language that was used to beat down populism in 1896 and this the language that was used that was sort of rolled out and deployed against franklin roosevelt in 1936 is very very similar to the language that is being used by today's democratic party because in both cases long ago these reactionary long ago and today are you know our modern sort of um, progressive minded minded center left democrats they both believe that they speak for a rightful meritocracy for a rightful hierarchy that they speak for the people who are on top because they deserve to be on top so the captains of industry in 1896 the great economists and uh, legal minds of 1936 and today the sort of uh, uh, upper echelons of the professional class who speak through the democratic party all of them believe that their position on top of the hierarchy is correct and moral and just and cannot be questioned and they 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 gravitate very naturally to this language and by the way it leaves exactly as you said it leaves all kinds of really obvious things, it makes it impossible to talk about them. Like if yeah. you ever go drive through my home state of Kansas or Missouri and look at some of the small towns out there and they're in a state of ruination. 
And it's obvious, and everybody that lives there knows this, and we aren't allowed to talk about it uh, for some reason. Or, or you talk about another, the concept that is absolutely forbidden in our politics, elite failure, okay? Th these, these professional managerial elites screw up again and again and again and again, right? The Vietnam War, the Iraq War, the, uh, the financial crisis, the bailouts, uh, on and on and on. And there's many examples, uh, and we're living through a, a colossal elite failure right at this very moment. And yet we're never allowed to talk about it as such. We're presented, the debate is between stupid people and listening to experts. And it's like, wait a minute, there's all this other stuff out there, you know? The experts sometimes screw things up, you know? It happens. And uh, it, we're not allowed to talk about that. Or we're, well, we, we, you and I, we're talking about it right now. What I mean is that it's a message that doesn't see, seem to get through to the people in our politics. Well, and it's very controversial to talk about is that when it shouldn't, shouldn't be controversial whatsoever. Um, as I said, the book is fantastic, as I told you off air. Um, Listen Liberal and What's the Matter with Kansas were two of the most influential political books for me in terms of how I think about politics. So thank you so much. It's really a pleasure and honor to have you today. Thanks, Thomas. Oh, listen, the pleasure is all mine. <laughs> Appreciate it, sir. <laughs> all all right. right, we'll see you guys. See you later. Next on Rising, we're going to tell you how and why AOC will be gone in 60 seconds when Rising continues. <laughs>